confess, after orgasm, I laugh hysterically. Bedpost Confessions is an Austin, Texas-based live show featuring smart storytelling and anonymous confessing. Stories heard at Bedpost Confessions, as well as sister shows Unspoken and Confess, all explore themes of humor, vulnerability, and emotional justice on varying topics. No matter the topic, the highlight of any Bedpost Productions is the participation of the audience members sharing their own secrets in the form of anonymous confessions, which are read aloud during the show. My story is a little bit easier for me to tell, so I'm going to start with saying... You know, thanks to my parents, because unlike a lot of people, I grew up as what they call a red diaper baby, and my mom was a legitimate hippie pagan witch, and my dad was a legitimate atheist socialist, and I got to spend my whole life with them telling me all sorts of things that most people had to wait till they were like 25 and reading the nation. So I got to spend a lot of my life without having a huge shame narrative. In fact, my dad used to say to me, well, just don't do things that you're ashamed of which is really good advice, but I was hearing him say, well, just do whatever you want. So that's kind of what I did. So three weeks ago, Rent Boy got raided by the Homeland Security, and for some reason, while they can't stop ISIS or like jail a single banker, they do have plenty of resources to come into lower Manhattan and bust like eight people and seize $20 million and put like every hoe on the planet out of work, or theoretically. So... I thought I would tell you guys a story about how I became a whore, because it starts right around the same time as our dear, sweet, departed rent boy. I'm going to set the scene for you. It's 1998, and I am 22 years old, and I am ripped, and I have, like, cute dye job hair, because it's the 90s, and I work in a heterosexual nightclub as a bartender. And every night, or the four days a week I work, heterosexuals come in to get laid. And they come, and they get wasted, and they do all sorts of, like, you know, straight mating rituals. And the girls will get, like, wasted and then climb all over me. All over me. And I quickly realize that, like, you know, if I let this chick kiss me, she'll tip me two more dollars. And, you know, this is back when bars took cards, so you could, like, rack up shit on your like the percentages or whatever. So I was like a really greedy bartender. I was like, oh yeah, I'll kiss her again. Oh yeah, I'll kiss her again. And then started being like, oh well, you know, if you let her put her hand down your pants, you get $3 now and like 20 bucks when she comes back in in three days and you tell her, hey, you non-consensually grabbed my dick and she's like totally mortified, humiliated. So I was like, okay, great. You'll just be like this guy who like works at the bar and lets the straight girl sort of paw them. And one day I'm sitting there, you know, doing my usual, cleaning up, getting ready. And there's this woman, ironically named Angel, who has been one of our regulars for many years. And she's sitting there watching me and she's like, keeps rolling her eyes at all the attention I'm getting and rolling her eyes. And there's a lull in the crowd. And I'm like, girl, what are you up to tonight? She's like, oh, you know, I don't know. I was thinking about working. I don't know. Oh, what do you do for a living? I think I'm making small talk, you know? The bartender says, oh, what do you do for a living? And Angel is like, do you want to know, really? And I'm like, well, all of a sudden, like, hella, yeah. Like, what do you do for, like, and she's like, okay, well, if I tell you, you can't do that thing that fags do where they suddenly become, like, arch Christians and get, like, really freaked out conservative for no reason. And I was like, oh, I think I will. I think I'll be okay. She's like, I'm a prostitute. And I literally was like, ah! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And I like, totally like clutched my pearls and was like, like I'm trying to like hold it together because I'm at work or whatever, but I'm like, uh, uh, do you like walk the street? And she's like, oh my god, girl. Ugh. And she like rolls her eyes so much. She's like, go back to work, come back to me in 20 minutes. So I, you know, like, come make some drinks and come back. And I was like, so, so really? And she's like, look, you're already a hoe. We both know how the world works. You're letting these chicks climb on you so you can get extra money. You've had sex with people you were not attracted to, and you took free drinks in favor of it. Yeah, these are pretty much all true. She's like, great. So I'm a hooker, and this is how I do it. There's this new service. It's called Craigslist. (laughs) And when I wake up in the morning, it's the 90s, you know? It's Craigslist new. She's like, when I wake up in the morning, I ask myself, do you want to have sex? And if the answer was yes, then I put up an ad. And 
by noon, I've made at least enough money to go buy lunch, right? And then I go buy lunch. And when I come back, I'm like, hmm, I guess I could do this a little bit longer. And so I unclutch my pearls. And I, like, do, like, like, a mental tally of what my bank account looks like. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is the best plan ever. <laughs> Seriously, I'm 22 and ripped, and I have way more hard-ons than I even know what to do with. How do I use the Craigslist? And she's like, oh, God, you are so basic. Except for us in the 90s, we didn't have language like basic. Um, but I was so basic. And so she was like, well, let's have dinner, and I'll teach you. And she invites me to her house, and she gives me all these pointers, like, this is how you write an ad, this is how you take pictures. Because remember, before there was not cameras on your phone, you actually, like, take pictures and develop them, and that was all stressful. Um, around, like, around nudity, it was very stressful. Um, and so she shows me, like, this is the kind of place you can go to get photos developed, and this is what you do. And then her advice is, and you can't live in some fucking hippie squat house that's all, like, high stress and, like, bikes everywhere and people coming in from dumpster diving missions and, like, people reading poetry with ukuleles in the living room. None of this turns your John on. Your John wants one thing from you. He wants to come to a beautiful, calm place to have sex and give you some money and then leave. She's like, so you better rent yourself an apartment. So I go to this other section of Craigslist back in the day when you could just go rent an apartment. It was affordable. And I rent myself this little tiny like studio apartment in the financial district of Denver. And it's like this crappy like double wide parked on top of a building. But it's entirely private and it costs like 250 bucks a month. And I am all of a sudden in business. And I am a bartender so I get off work at 5 o'clock in the morning and I'm like, I'm going to do a commuter special. This will be so awesome. I'll mop the floors, close the door, turn off the alarm take a cab to my house, put up my ad, and everyone who's like stuck in traffic at 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. can come to be my bed night snack. I was like, this will be great. But I'm 22, and I had no idea about the whole world of sex. You know, like I was aware, like, you know, people do this, people do that, people do... But I didn't actually know, like, how much things people do when it comes to trying to make themselves have orgasms. And all of a sudden, I am like blowing up like people are like, will you blah 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 and I'm like, I don't know what that means. will you blah 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 oh, maybe. will you blah 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 and I am like clearly in over my head but also like clocking dick for days you know what I mean I am like on it having a bunch of sex really enjoying myself and also trying to be like a good worker and do my job so you know porn used to be harder to get too so I would go down to the actual porn store and I would get like little jack off magazines and you know I was an English major so I'd read them for tropes and I'd see like what are the major archetypes of fantasies like you know oh are you calling me because you need it to be like this or is it slightly more like that and people would like you know talk to you like oh wow it's kind of like talking to a phone psychic how did you know I really wanted to be like blah 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 and be like well dude I read all the fucking porn and your weird particular fetish and there was only five tropes so you know like I'll pick the most common one and ask if that's yours so I became a home and I learned all sorts of stuff about humans and sex and I was I was really into it and one day I went on a date with a boy for free and I fell in love and that you know, after we did it, so it was probably our second date, I could kind of tell that we were in, like, very different stages of our psychosexual development. I was like, hmm. So we just sort of, like, had a few conversations, and it came out that maybe he'd only been with, like, eight or nine guys, and, you know, that was kind of crazy for him, and he believed in monogamy, and, and that was, like, a really beautiful way for gay men to live, and I, bold face, lied. <laughs> Me too. Me too, baby. I've been with, like, I mean, probably less than a dozen guys, I'm sure. Like, it, it's probably probably only, like, seven guys. And i for sure never been to a bathhouse or done threesomes or anything else that's going to stress you out because I want you to be my boyfriend and love me. <laughs> right? <laughs> so then we're dating and we're monogamous. But I don't, like, give up my career because that would be idiotic. And, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like, I'm a feminist. I'm not going to give up my career for a man. And so, like... <laughs> I was like pretending that I wasn't a hoe and he worked like a breakfast shift and I was, a, you know, I had the bartending shift. So I would like tuck him in and be like, oh, have a good day at work, baby. I'll see you when you get off. And then I'd have sex. And when he got home, I'd be like, oh, look, I cleaned the house too. And I, I was trying to be like a really good guy with this like one giant glaring lie, like sort of like running all through the relationship. 
But I was only doing it like, you know, like three Johns a week or four Johns a week. And I was really enjoying the like act of buying him presents with it. Like, oh, look, baby, I randomly found $200. Let's go have sushi. I don't know where it came from. I guess I'm just bad at math. <laughs> like, and like, I mean, years go by of me playing this like little ruse. And then, you know, we're in this beautiful love moment. We've been together a couple years. I'm still being a total dishonest asshole. And he's like, we should move to the country and become organic farmers. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's my dream, too. We should move to the country and become organic farmers. And then all of a sudden, I really understand what tax-free money is for. And I'm like, mm, I'm not going to tell you anything, but I'm going to be very tired for the next eight weeks while we save up money to go like live in a van and be hippies. And then I am like on the ha ha hoeing mission. I am like four clients a day, three clients a day. What's wrong with me if I can't get three clients? I was like so much sex. I was like, I am going to make enough money that we can live out of a van and pretend to be hippies for as long as we want to. And he'll never be the wiser because we'll live in paradise by the time he finds out. So I stockpile all this money and we run away and we start a farm and it's beautiful. And there's like chickens and ducks and all the like bucolic shit you want to picture. Like, gay boys hoeing in the woods like oh it's so beautiful and romantic and except we can't pay our fucking mortgage we're super down broke we're like so down broke we cannot pay our mortgage on our stupid dream farm and he comes to me and he's like i want you because you're the top to go and you know stupid right because you're the top i want you to go get a job and um i was thinking you could get a job at the gas station that's down the way and the gas station that's down the way from our farm is like 28 miles each direction and pays like $7 an hour. And I'm like, mm, that's not going to pay our mortgage. And also, I'm not going to do that. And then I have this beautiful moment of like pure bravery slash I'm not going to do all that. And I'm like, so um, let's go back to the second date, baby. I might have told you a small exaggeration about the way I've conducted my sex life over the years. I used to be a prostitute. Don't be mad, though. And his eyes sort of, like, narrow. And instead of this, like, screaming fit that I'm expecting of him, he's like, how dare you? Blah, 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 blah. He's like, hold on. And he goes to the internet. And he does about 20 minutes worth of research, and he's like, you know, living in the country, there's this thing called trucker sucker. And... Um, apparently they have like a, like an escort side that's like people who do massages or like can guarantee lays for truck drivers as they go across the country. And I, you know, I didn't know this. I was like, oh, you don't say, hmm, let's peruse this website together. So we look at the website and I was like, oh yeah, I could totally do this. This will be fine. This is like, this is an easy hustle. And so I start hoeing. And I'm happily hoeing in our, like, farmland. And it's really so different than being in the city. And being a hooker in the country, for mostly truckers, you really learn where America's at. You see all sorts of things that you had no idea were going to happen. Like, you can kind of extrapolate all the bullshit you think might be happening in South America right now. But the middle of nowhere... After 80 years of crystal meth, you have no idea how fucked up the country queens are trying to get their dick sucked. I was mortified, but I was a good soldier, and we paid our mortgage. But ultimately, we split, and you know the farm broke up, and I ran away, and I moved to San Francisco, and my dad was so worried about me, and he was calling me all the time, baby, are you okay, baby, are you okay, baby, are you okay? But I was sort of like, while I was emotionally distraught and really sad about losing my farm, I was now in the promised land of both gay sex and whores. And it was like the same year that they were trying to pass Proposition K and we were going to legalize prostitution. So I was like, yes, let's be activists around this topic. Let's be really like up front and say prostitution is a real job. Prostitution is really important. And I can speak in front of City Hall because I'm no longer a farmer and I have all this extra time. So I'm trying to be this full pull, like, hoe activist. And I'm making all this porn, and I'm hoeing around. I'm giving talks about how important hoeing is. And my dad just will not stop blowing up my fucking cell phone. Are you all right? I remember when I had my first breakup. Hey, Dad, I got to go. I'm going to a photo shoot. And I kept saying this, and I kind of had forgotten that I kept saying, Dad, I'm going to a photo shoot. So finally, after a couple of years of being in San Francisco and doing all this hoeing, 
I've made enough money and I go home for Christmas. And I'm home and my sister, who's a stand-up comedian and a lesbian, and I are like at the table with my dad. And he's like, so, it feels like your career is going great because every time I talk to you, you're about to go to like a photo shoot. <laughs> and I'm like, oh God, please don't let this be true. But I haven't been home in years. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, so when do I get to see the photos? And I'm like, mm. well, a lot of them are like, uh, like kind of erotic or like risque. My dad's like, Zachary, I'm not a prude. Like what? Are you wearing like latex or a blindfold or like licking something you shouldn't be? He was like, I, he's like, you know, I have the internet. I kind of an idea what you might be up to. And I was like, dad, photo shoot means porn. And I'm like, you know, like in that smallest, like <gasps> waiting for the shoe to drop. And he's like, are you hung enough to be in porn? <laughs> and my sister hits the ground, like cackling, like, ah, ha, ha, I told you he's going to ask that. Ha, ha, ha. And I'm like, oh my God, dad, why did you just ask me that? That's like way more embarrassing than he asked if I identified as a top or a bottom. And he's like, well, I mean, if you're my son, like, did I, like, are you hung enough to be in porn? And I was like, ah, dad, my God, please don't ask me this again. And he was like, well, how did you even get into porn? And my sister is like kicking me at the table, like, girl, like, do not just leave this as like a partial confessional. Just like, and I was like, okay, fine. Dad, remember how you told me never to do anything I was ashamed of? I was like, yeah. I was like, I've been a prostitute for like 14 years. Sorry about all that. And he was like, people pay you for sex? And I was like, yeah, and he's like, even when you've like fluctuated weight? <laughs> yes, dad. Even when you had that terrible pink hair, yeah, dad, actually the pink hair actually kind of sold. <laughs> no, people didn't buy the pink hair, Zachary. Okay, you're right. Nobody bought the fucking pink hair. But my dad is like trying to have this like legitimate, like I understand you conversation. And I'm like, I'm going to literally die of humiliation. So I'm like, okay, great. Family time over. No, like let's not talk about me anymore. And I like bring the end of the conversation to a halt. And that was where I was thinking about ending this whole story. But where it really ends is a few years later, my mom dies and my dad is so distraught. And he is just like this broken, sad man who can't figure out what to do with himself now. And I'm like, you should go get fucking laid. And he's like, Zachary, how would I do that? I'm like 72, I've had a bunch of surgeries. I'm disgusting. I'm a completely unattractive person. And I was like, okay, dad. Remember how once upon a time I went out on having this whole don't be ashamed of anything you do conversation? I think that you should take your fixed income and you should crunch the numbers and you should decide how many times per year you need to get laid. And then you should budget that and meet somebody you enjoy or a couple people you enjoy. And if you want my, and he's like, oh my God, that was enough information. I can, I can Google. I do not need your help. I don't need your help. Let's just, like, oh, let's go back to the funeral. Ooh, who wants shots? And I'm like, okay, great. <sighs> and we like both like, you know, back down from this like masculine awkward moment. And um, the moral of the story is, while he's never going to talk to me about it, I like to think that, you know, four to 12 or however many times a year my dad needs to get laid that someone hella cool who is hella respected for their work and is hella safe in doing it is coming over and giving him a service that everyone needs. Tip your sex workers. <laughs> Bed Post Confessions is produced by Julie Gillis, Mia Martina, and Sadie Smythe. Audio production is by Ian Danskin. Confess with us at bedpostconfessions.com. Until next time, we will leave you with a few other confessions from the audience. I confess, my brother's best friend was the captain of my basketball team and also my group leader at church youth group. During a luncheon, I drank his piss out of the very clean church bathroom urinal and came in my hand and then fed it to some flowers in the lobby. Flowers need to eat.